So to kick us off today, I'm really delighted to uh, have with us Lisbeth Shore, and she is a senior fellow of the Center for the Study of Social Policy, where she works with colleagues on efforts to broaden the understanding of evidence as, applies, as applied to the design and evaluation of complex initiatives. She is also a lecturer in social medicine at Harvard University and a member of the executive committee of the Aspen Institute's Roundtable on Community Change. She is the author of two books, Within Our Reach, Breaking the Cycle of Disadvantage, and Common Purpose, Strengthening Families and Neighborhoods to Rebuild America. So please join me for our keynote speaker this morning, Elizabeth Shore. Seems like such a propitious time to be holding a workshop on evidence-based violence prevention. Suddenly everybody is talking about violence prevention, not just a few experts and advocates. Uh, less suddenly, but over the years, evidence too has risen to the top of many crucial agendas. I hope to do justice to at least part of your topic, despite the fact that I lack expertise in violence prevention. Uh, and a lot of you have tilled the uh, ground on both violence prevention and evidence more deeply than I have. You all know the story about the guy who survived the Jonestown flood and went to heaven and said to St. Peter he wanted to tell everybody about the Jonestown flood. And St. Peter said, that's just fine as long as you know that Noah will be in the audience. <laughs> A lot of Noahs in this audience. Uh, the role of evidence in public policy has changed so radically from when I first became involved in social policy, which was very long ago in the mid-1960s. At that time, a compelling vision, good intentions, and a champion with a lot of clout was often enough. But that era, of course, didn't last. Uh, calls for hard evidence of effectiveness grew in the 80s and 90s, and social scientists were enlisted uh, uh, and aspired to the same precision uh, that was achieved by their biological colleagues. They developed randomized experiments to assess social programs and policies, especially those whose effectiveness was uh, suspect, like foreign aid, domestic programs starting the poor, targeting the poor. So legislators began to mandate the use of control groups and experimental design as a condition for funding, and foundations uh, aspired to be equally scientific and a substantial evaluation industry grew and web-based clearinghouses appeared with lists of programs certified by experimental trials. Early in the Obama administration, the OMB took the lead in establishing a climate in which evidence would play an ever larger role in decisions about the allocation of federal funds. That move was greeted with considerable enthusiasm by policymakers, practitioners, and philanthropies, many of whom had long advocated the greater application of rigorous methods to inform decisions to adopt and scale up and expand effective programs and strategies and to turn around, reform, or weed out ineffective efforts. When what works and what doesn't is the critical question, and when the single preferred method of learning about what works is experimental evaluation, it's almost inevitable that we gravitate to the narrower question of which programs work and which don't. To make sure that we do fund or encourage, that what we do fund or encourage carries a low risk of failure, we look for programs that have been proven. We seek to disseminate information about these evidence-based programs so that communities and agencies will select from and implement and scale them, sometimes with adaptation to new circumstances, but preferably with fidelity to the original 
Now, some of the downsides and complications of that mindset you've already flagged or implied in some of your materials and certainly in some of the discussion yesterday. I want to focus some more on the question of whether the current pressures to maximize effectiveness and to minimize risk in the allocation of public and philanthropic funds by singling out experimental methods as the only really credible source of evidence may have some unintended consequences. I want to suggest that these pressures might even interfere with efforts to develop effective strategies, especially effective prevention strategies. I want to flag four ideas on how we could simultaneously make sure that the work we promote is indeed evidence-based while striving for greater impact by becoming more inclusive in our search for evidence and by expanding our approach to evidence beyond what programs work. I think we have to try to understand how and why programs work as they are implemented in the real world and to extend our inquiries to strategies that go far beyond individual programs to include the contexts that often determine the success or failure of our work. So the first of these ideas is that we would do well to draw on and integrate, and we've talked a lot about integrating evidence, integrate the evidence that comes from multiple methods of evaluation, as well as from other research and from practice. People working at the front lines understand that experimental evaluations provide essential information about what works, but so do the insights that come out of other research and practice. We need to learn systematically from the whole range of efforts to improve outcomes. We need a broader knowledge base, not a narrower one, that considers experimental evidence, uh, a narrow one that considers experimental evidence as the sole proof of effectiveness. To do justice to the questions we need to answer, our methodologies must range from formative and evaluative and developmental evaluations to case and inquiry-based studies and performance data. We have to look beyond program data. M many of you are probably familiar with the findings of the Project on Human Development in Chicago neighborhoods. They found that the largest single predictor of crime levels in the neighborhood study, neighborhoods studied was collective efficacy, which the researchers defined as mutual trust among neighbors combined with willingness to intervene on behalf of the common good. Among neighborhoods that were demographically similar, those scoring high on collective efficacy had crime rates 40% below those in the lower scoring neighborhoods. You're probably also aware that we have no proven interventions that have created collective efficacy in a neighborhood. What this suggests to me is that we add to our questions about what works questions about what the research tells us about what might work and how to identify the opportunities to intervene. Another illustration of how we would do well to be more inclusive in what evidence we consider credible and useful comes from the Nurse Family Partnership. Some of you may know NFP as the probably most rigorously proven early childhood interventions. It fields nurses to make home visits to low-income mothers pregnant with their first child in the hope of reducing child abuse. Its original model was tested in three RCTs beginning 34 years ago. It saw modest reductions in child abuse and neglect, but its most consistent results were in prolonging the intervals between the birth of these mothers' first and second infants. Practitioners implementing this program found they couldn't retain the most depressed mothers. They weren't able to enroll families with substance abuse or domestic violence issues, and they were unable to deal with frequent housing crises, which also turned out to be big risk factors. Community groups that were eager to respond to these risk factors with new partnerships were discouraged from doing so because funds were reserved for those implementing previously proven programs. And when they added these other pieces, 
they were no longer implementing a proven program. Second, we should be identifying proven and promising evidence approaches and elements. A recent study by the National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine reviewed the research on the prevention of mental disorders and substance abuse among young people. And they recommended more attention not to proven programs, but to proven approaches. They contrasted these with current treatment practices, which they said result in a patchwork that isolates single problems and often fails to help both individuals and institutions to develop the strengths that support well-being. The Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University, and this may also be known to many of you, examined research on the effectiveness of interventions aimed at reducing recidivism among delinquent youth. They looked for systematic patterns of factors associated with effectiveness that would extend evidence-based practice beyond single models. They found that much of the program's effectiveness could be accounted for by a relatively small number of quite straightforward factors like the decision to target high-risk cases and to take a therapeutic approach to changing behavior rather than a control or deterrence philosophy. This meant that close attention to these factors in the design and implementation of locally developed programs could make a wider range of approaches qualify as evidence-based, even though they didn't replicate a brand name program. An example of a subtle element that also goes deeper than specific programs and turns out to be crucial in making more tangible uh, interventions effective is the cultivation of trust. When a household survey done by the Harlem Children's Zone found that there, the children in the area had five times as high a rate of asthma as the national average. The Harlem Children's Zone mobilized a collection of interventions, some evidence-based and some evidence-informed, which may be a better term for us to use uh, at least sometimes than evidence-based. Ev evidence um, they had no blueprint for how the interventions would react, how they would interact. As it worked out, Harlem Hospital provided the medical care, Columbia School of Public Health supported data collection, City Health Department and the Columbia Urban Planning Program gave technical assistance on environmental aspects. And when HCZ reached out to neighborhood families about what to do in their homes, to reduce the incidence and severity of their children's asthma. It was HCZ's deep ties that it had already established with these families that allowed the families to trust HCZ enough to act on the advice they got. And the results were documented in dramatically decreased hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and school absences. Take another example, when Tony Bright, who's now president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, led a study of uh, Chicago school reform, he and his colleagues were able to establish with empirical evidence the links between what he termed relational trust and academic achievement. He concluded that while good relationships and trust won't compensate for bad instruction, poorly trained teachers, or unworkable school structures, reform efforts will fail unless there are strong levels of trust among teachers, between teachers and principals, and between the school staff and parents. He explained that a broad base of trust across a school community lubricates much of a school's day-to-day -day functioning and is a critical resource as local leaders embark on ambitious improvement plans. Critical resource very difficult to capture. Third, we, um, we have to find ways to generate and apply evidence in ways that encourage innovation and the cultivation of partnerships to achieve collective impact. 
One of the quite stunning, stunning developments of the last several years is the growing recognition that to achieve the ends we seek, whether we're trying to prevent violence, reduce race or income-based health and achievement gaps, or rebuild neighborhoods, we can't get there program by program or project by project. And the most highly prized evaluation methods often don't capture the learning from more innovative and comprehensive solutions, and certainly not in a timely way. Many of today's efforts to improve the life chances of those who are most at risk find they have to generate, test, and adapt novel solutions to achieve significant results. Susan Popkin describes one of the Urban Institute's housing opportunity and services together demonstration sites in Chicago as illustrating the overwhelming need to respond to trauma, grief, and fear among those we work with, and the concentrated effort needed to address the factors that contribute to the cycle of chronic violence that has such high costs. These efforts become even more urgent as we learn more about the relationship between early trauma and later violence. Maybe the most striking example of success in reaching beyond individual isolated interventions comes from the country's experience in reducing tobacco use. As states began to analyze their numbers beginning in the 1960s, it became clear that none of the single tested interventions had much of an effect on their own. It was multi-pronged combinations of strategies that turned out to be powerful. What ultimately worked involved a combination of legislation, public health programming, media campaigns, and the healthcare system. It turned out that the more components that were targeted on the clearly defined results, the better the results. Two states, California and Massachusetts, undertook the most comprehensive interventions and were able to double and then triple their annual rate of decline in tobacco consumption. The other states showed more interest in the data from these two states than from several thousand controlled trials in the scientific literature because the multiple strategies of these two states had actually been able to achieve massive change. Fourth and last, we have to be willing to use intelligence, qualitative knowledge and judgment to understand and make sense of the numbers. I rely on Nate Silver, the New York Times election numbers guru, to make this point. When I consistently read Nate Silver in the couple of months running up to last year's presidential election, uh, it did much to keep my spirits up and calm some of my anxieties. And it got me very interested in Nate Silver. How did he get 49 of 50 states right four years ago and all 50 right this time? So I started reading his just published book. What particularly caught my attention was the importance that this numbers nerd assigned to judgment the judgments you have to make before you can use the numbers to advantage. He wrote, the numbers have no way of speaking for themselves. We speak for them. We endow them with meaning. He says that when we think about how to test our ideas, we must become more comfortable with probability and uncertainty. Now, the counsel to become more comfortable with probability and uncertainty in assessing evidence may be surprising in an era when data-driven is so often interpreted as meaning that we can rely on the numbers alone to be our guide. But Nate Silver's advice is a good fit with that of the organization theorist Don Schoen uh, from MIT with what he told us. He urged us not to be taken in by what he called the nihilistic view of public affairs, that nothing can be known because the certainty we demand is unattainable. 
the idea that nothing is worth knowing unless you know it for sure certainly has its place when the FDA is assessing powerful drugs. And even when we are assessing circumscribed, defined, standardized interventions, a new math curriculum, say, or perhaps the electronic tracking of guns. But the same method won't help us to understand complex place-based interventions that make whole neighborhoods safer. Our data and the learning we generate and analyze have to reflect the fact that in efforts to make positive changes for families and neighborhoods and communities, not only is the whole much greater than the sum of the parts, but how, what, how we implement what works is key. We have to use our intelligence to understand how the parts interact, how they influence each other, how they contribute to an initiative's overall impact. Our learning has to explain how and why a strategy is effective, not just whether it works. This more inclusive approach to evidence is organized around results. It connects activities, even systems change, to outcomes but it does not insist on drawing a straight line between activities and outcomes. The unsolved problems that we face today with high, violence high among them are complex, refi, require reforms of institutions, policies, and systems that have to be adapted to a variety of cultures and populations, require thoughtful implementation, and should be continually evolving in responses to changes in context, advances in knowledge, and lessons learned. These so-called adaptive problems can't be solved by isolated initiatives or by holding proven programs constant. No single organization has sufficient resources or authority to bring about the necessary change. That's why we have to bring intelligence and judgment to the table to make sense of the numbers in the context of significant long-term results. It takes intel intelligence and experience, not just numbers, to determine whether a lack of results is the product of failed theory, poor implementation, inadequate dosage, inappropriate measure measurement, or an unsupportive policy context. Andrew Natsios, the former head of USAID, says that a narrow reliance on numerical results is at odds with the fact that transformational programs are often the least measurable and involve elements of risk and uncertainty. Development work in poor countries with weak institutions, he says, involves a particularly high degree of uncertainty and risk. He suggests that the preoccupation with numbers limits funding for the most transformational initiatives and for interventions that generate less tangible, more difficult to measure outcomes, such as strength and community cohesion. Indeed, says Susan Beresford, the former president of the Ford Foundation, when we go too far in insisting that only measurable short-term impacts count as success, we will miniaturize ambition for doing risky but potentially breakthrough work. In conclusion, I want to say the obvious. Knowing what works and why in the expenditure of public and philanthropic funds is increasingly important in an era of austerity and accountability. I hope it's clear that I'm not advocating a retreat from generating, analyzing, and using rigorous evidence in decision making, especially when it comes to prevention. I am saying that as we struggle to put together a knowledge base that will lead to effective action, we become more sophisticated, more inclusive, and less mechanistic and less linear in how we think about and use evidence. Thank you.